Welcome everyone to AER Live, a new series of online interactive workshops from Applied Ecology Resources, or AER. I'm Dr. Carolyn Curley, and I'm the lead editor, one of the lead editors of AER's Associated Journal, Ecological Solutions and Evidence. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. We're broadcasting these free online workshops for applied ecologists around the world to support better informed evidence-based conservation and practice. We're delighted to exclusively announce today that AER is now live. AER is a globally accessible open platform that makes sharing and discovering the information on the management of biodiversity and the environment easier for everyone in the ecological community, whether you work in research, policy, or practice. You can now browse, search for, and filter on the AER website to find our freely accessible and citable content, which includes open access journal articles, research summaries, case reports, and other gray literature all in one place. So more information will be provided at the end of the workshop, but you can visit www.appliedecologyresources.org to find out more. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Wildlife Acoustics, for this month's AER Live. The relaxing nature soundscape you heard before in the beginning slide at the start of the workshop was recorded by today's sponsor who creates the world's leading bioacoustic research tools. More details of their services, including free training courses, will also be provided in a slide at the end of the workshop. So I'll shortly hand this over to our speaker, Dr. Patty Bio, who's giving today's talk. But before I do, here are a few housekeeping rules. So the workshop will be recorded and posted online. So please keep your camera and audio off at all times. Please submit any questions you have for Dr. Bio using the Zoom chat box and I will curate them and ask some questions during the question and answer period at the end of the talk. So without waiting any longer, let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Patty Bio for her talk, What Does It Take to Eradicate Invasive Species from Islands? So over to you, Patty. Well, good morning, everyone. And um, I first like to thank for the invitation to give a talk um, to this group. Um, it's uh, always, always good to share um, some of the work that we're doing and some of the lessons that we've learned um, with uh, broader audiences. Um, I'm sorry for my background uh, noise here. So I'm, I'm Patty and I'm with Island Conservation and I'm the um, US Head of Operations for Island Conservation. I'm based um, in Hawaii, um, Honolulu, Hawaii. And um, so I, I oversee our projects in the US. Um, and today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the overarching kind of lessons that we've learned on how to eradicate invasive species from islands and use a few, uh, one example in particular here from Hawaii um, of a project that kind of touches on, on some of those uh, particular uh, lessons. Um, so I don't know why, I'm, oh, there we go. Uh, so for those of you that are not super familiar with island conservation, we are an NGO. We're based in, uh, we're headquartered in um, California, um, Santa Cruz, but we have programs in the Southwest Pacific, um, in Palau and uh, New Zealand and uh, French Polynesia and um, a lot of wonderful uh, places. Um, and we have a US program that I'm, um, uh, I work with and we have our South America program that has um, pro projects in the Galapagos Islands, but also um, in Chile and uh, Costa Rica and, and so on and so forth. So, so we are a US headquarter NGO, a small but mighty um, organization. We work in a lot of um, wonderful places. And the reason why we work on islands is that islands represent a lot. And so to start with, they are a very small uh, percentage of the, the Earth's land mass. Um, so it's about 5% of all the Earth's land mass, but they are, as I said before, mighty, and, and they, they carry a disproportionate amount of biodiversity. So if you look at particular groups such as avian uh, biodiversity, 19% of that is found on islands. And they're also home to about 11% of the people of the world. Um, so they are home to cultures and ways of living that are um, uh, very special. Unfortunately, they are also um, have, have been the stage of a lot of the extinctions and they are at the heart of the extinction crisis. Um, so, of the extinctions that we know, the reported extinctions, about 75% of the terrestrial vertebrate um, uh, 
species that have gone extinct have gone extinct on islands. So they are unfortunately being the stage of um, uh, a hotspot for extinctions. And they moreover continue on that path of extinction. And if you look at the currently critically endangered and endangered species um, uh, today of vertebrates, 41% of those are found on islands um, still yet. So, so there's a lot to be lost um, still on island species. Um, and of those 75% um, of extinctions uh, on islands, we know that a large amount of them, 86%, um, have had invasive species as at least one of the causes um, for, for the extinctions of, the, of species on islands. So um, the reason why island conservation focuses its efforts on islands and to re is in removing, our mission is to prevent extinctions on islands by removing invasive species. And the reason we do that is because once you remove an invasive species from an island um, permanently, um, there is um, a, a very quick um, regeneration and restoration of island ecosystems, native island ecosystems. So we, we focus our efforts on, on islands because of that. It's a very high return on investment um, from a conservation perspective. and, and Around the world, eradications um, of invasive species on islands have been very successful. So what you're looking at is about 1,200 dots on this map um, that represent islands where um, invasive species have been successfully eradicated uh, from. So these are islands that have had um, all, all sorts of different um, invasive species, rodents, ungulates, um, uh, macaques in some instances. So there's a lot of different types of eradications that have happened. Um, but the success rate uh, for eradications on islands is overall about 85%. So it's a very uh, reliable tool um, if you apply all the principles that we'll be, we'll be talking about later today. Um, it, it's a reliable tool to remove a threat uh, and prevent extinctions. Um, so, so globally, um, the efforts to eradicate invasive species has been very successful. And still yet, what you're looking at now is a lot more dots, and those represent islands where you, you currently still have um, species that are listed and invasive species that overlap with them. So these represent opportunities of islands that could benefit still yet from um, eradications. And, and a lot of them can, can be accomplished with the current tools that we have but some of them are um, kind of at that edge of what the current tools allow us to do and kind of press us to, um, for the need of development of new tools and innovations that could take us to the next step of the more complex, more, bigger and more complex islands um, um, in the world. But it's still a lot of work to do. We've, we've been able to, um, to do a lot and prevent a lot of extinctions, but there's still a lot of work um, ahead of us um, when it comes to island species. And I think one, one important thing to just mention and keep in mind is that eradications of an eradication of an invasive species is really a means to an end. Um, it's not an end in itself. Um, just removing the, um, the the invasive species is not the measure of success. Um, it's what happens next with the restoration of the islands that really is the, the success stories. And we have seen a lot of those success stories. And one that I'd like to mention here comes from uh, Palmyra Atoll. Um, and Palmyra Atoll is just south of um, the Hawaiian Islands here on the Line Islands. And um, it's one of the last stands of the Pisonia forest, um, a very highly endangered um, uh, plant. And rats uh, were introduced um, to Palmyra Atoll and um, caused havoc in, in, in the, the native ecosystems there. And, and they caused problems for um, seabirds and crabs and plants and all of the, the native species um, on Palmyra. And in 2011, um, Island Conservation um, and Partners, TNC, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, removed rats, eradicated rats from, from Palmyra Atoll. And what we see uh, very shortly after is that, um, for example, the Pisonia Forest has, you know, been steadily um, uh, regenerating um, that forest. And by 2017, we've had seen a 5,000% increase in recruitment um, of Pisonia forest on, on 
on uh, Palmyra. And Paisonia is a very important um, plant um, in the atoll um, native ecosystem because it's one of the favorite uh, breeding, uh, seabird breeding um, plants. Um, so they, they, they build nests and they use Paisonia uh, for breeding. So it's one of those important ecological species that uh, support a broader um, uh, uh, community of seabirds on, on the atoll. So uh, a, as you can tell from this, you know, just six years um, after the rate of education, you've seen uh, remarkable uh, regeneration and restoration of, of some native um, ecosystems, which is um, not always the case with conservation interventions. You know, sometimes, most times, uh, conservation interventions have much longer um, uh, uh, outcome uh, timeframes. Um, and, and with islands, it's very rewarding to see how fast um, these things happen. And by doing eradications on islands, we have also um, seen that we contribute beyond just biodiversity. Um, so it, we, we did a recent study just looking past and looking at the eradications that have happened um, up until now and how they overlap with, for instance, um, the sustainable development goals. And what we found is that by eradicating invasive species from islands, you also um, uh, benefit and, and advance a lot of these um, sustainable goals that we as a society have put forward as a way to, um, to, to better our, our world and, and, and make it um, sustainable into the future. So eradications are not just a way to improve um, or to prevent extinctions on islands, but they also contribute more broadly to sustainable development and um, um, improved livelihoods on islands and improved um, um, uh, ecosystems on islands as a, as a more general principle. Um, so, so we know that it's, it's doable. We know it's feasible. It's being repeated many, many times. And because of, of that, we have been able to um, we have been able to extract basic principles of eradication um, that, if followed, um, give you the highest likelihood of success um, when, when trying to eradicate an invasive species. So these are six basic principles that we live by, um, so to speak, um, uh, at Island Conservation um, in trying to make sure that we're following uh, the best practices and, and taking advantage of lessons learned uh, from, from the many projects that have done eradications in the past. So the first one of those is that when you go out to eradicate um, a species, it, it's very different from a control effort. And the reason is that you're going at that 100 percentile, right? So you're trying to um, get at that very last individual. So you have to um, uh, plan your eradication and your strategies um, in a way that achieves, um, that, that reaches that very last individual and not just the majority of them. So one basic principle is that all individuals in that population have to be put at risk by your strategy, right? So if you're using, for instance, uh, rodenticides to eradicate rats, you have to be sure that every single rat in that population will have access to the rodenticide, um, to the bait that contains the rodenticide that you're putting out on the island. So making sure that distribution of bait in that case is um, widespread and is done to every potential rat territory is how you ensure that all individuals will be put at risk uh, by your strategy. Um, the second one is that you obviously need to eradicate the target individuals faster than, than they can reproduce. So this is um, more applicable on hunting operations. Um, so a good example is rabbits. Um, they reproduce pretty quickly. And, you know, when you're trying to remove the, all of the population, you have to be sure that while you're doing it, they're not making more of them. So you have to be quicker than um, they can um, um, reestablish themselves. Um, the third one is that um, you don't teach your target species um, to be aware of your technique. So you don't educate them um, on, on your technique. And what that really means is that uh, another example from the rodent eradications is that if you use a, a rodenticide, for instance, that 
makes uh, rats sick immediately uh, following the use, the, the consumption of the rodenticide, they very quickly learn to associate that, um, that ill feeling to the bait and will no longer consume the bait and will no, not receive a lethal dose. So you're educating them that the bait will cause them to be ill. So what we have been using, um, what we currently use is a bait or a rodenticide that has a delayed effect um, so that rats don't associate the, the consumption to the ill effect that it causes and, and it doesn't educate the species. But that goes beyond um, if you, again, in a hunting situation, you know, you don't want to miss your shot and educate your um, target species on um, your techniques and your strategies to, to get to them. Um, the, the fourth one is that non-target risks are minimized and mitigated. So one overarching principle is that your benefits should always outweigh your risks. Um, so your long-term benefits have to be, um, have to leave the island better than um, your short-term risks um, that, that you incur can cause. Um, so uh, when we go, when we plan eradications on islands, we have to be very careful of how your strategy may impact species that are non, not part of your target um, population. So um, again, for rodenticides is a good example in that um, the bait is available on the ground and other, other species will consume the bait. And if, if there is a path of exposure to species of concern or um, otherwise, then you really have to create strategies that minimize, avoid, minimize, or mitigate the, those risks um, and, and make sure that the benefits do outweigh those risks at the, in the long run. Um, the fifth kind of speaks to um, biosecurity um, more generally, and that is just making sure that the risk of reinvasion is kept effectively at zero. Um, and that sometimes means that you're able to prevent any any uh, reintroductions of the species, but sometimes it just means that you need to have rapid response in place that effectively, when there is a new incursion, you can respond quickly uh, before the population is reestablished. Um, so you have to protect your investment, so to speak. Um, once you removed the invasive species, you have to make sure that they're not gonna be able to return and, and reestablish um, on the island. And the last one is, I think, what we're going to be talking the most about today, and it, it speaks to um, kind of the local, social, um, political context um, that eradications are nested within. So they, they are technical projects. Um, in At the core, they are technical projects that need to be thought thoroughly and, and planned uh, thoroughly. But the reality is that they're always nested within social political contexts that need to be taken into account and need to be incorporated into, into how you're planning um, your, your, your eradication project. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So this is kind of the overall project cycle that we follow um, um, and others follow as well. And what you see at the top are the general phases that we, we usually follow, but at the bottom are the things that are always gonna be present, right? That you're gonna be always working towards um, as you move through those phases. So they're kind of overarching um, needs for projects. Um, and so it all starts with, you know, IDing a project and creating an enabling partnership that shares a vision uh, for that project. So. So that is, you know, um, establishing that that project as a priority um, within that partnership. So this typically means that you've identified an island that has resources at risk, um, you know, by the threat of, of invasive species, and you've identified a group of partners that share a vision for that island to be free of that invasive species. And so that's kind of that first um, step into creating a strong partnership in um, creating a project per se, you know, something that we can all work towards and we can all work together towards um, achieving. 
So once that's done, you go into a project planning phase that includes things um, like technical planning, operational planning, but also compliance uh, and all the, 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 um, the, the, the different processes that have to move forward um, to, to make the project feasible um, uh, on the ground, to assess uh, your assumptions and test those assumptions into um, a good strategy that gives you the, the highest likelihood of success. And then typically the shortest phase is the implementation phase. Um, and in some, in some, um, some uh, examples with rodent eradications, um, this really takes maybe a month, um, but it can take years before that um, to get to that point where you can go out and, and implement. And the wrap up usually involves not only um, monitoring, environmental monitoring of your, of your tools, make sure that your um, assumptions of risks were correct and that you're not, um, there weren't any um, uh, consequences to not targets that you didn't expect and, and things like that. But also um, it goes into the next phase of um, trying to establish what, what are the benefits right, from, from this eradication. So comparing um, the, the risk restoration of the island to baseline data and things like that um, happen in, the, in this wrap up phase that can last uh, many years if you if you're monitoring long term. And I just want to mention the, the the bottom ones that are, you know, obviously overarching and uh, those are risk management stakeholders engagement communications fundraising making sure that you have, you know, enough funds to complete the process. Uh, protecting your investment with biosecurity and, and good, um, strong project management um, to go along with it. So to kind of make it all more real, um, it's always useful to have an example. So the example I brought to you today is one from Hawaii. Um, so this is Lihua Island. Um, it's a small um, island, um, about 110 hectares. Um, it's also a high island. Um, so one that could potentially be very important in the future where um, sea level rises is a reality and, and um, species need a refuge um, to go to from um, low-lying atolls and, and whatnot. Um, it carries a very uh, diverse seabird colony. Um, it, it is actually the, the largest and most diverse seabird colony in any of the, the main Hawaiian islands. Um, and, you know, it's just... It's, it, to, to quantify that, we have 17 seabirds and 14 native plant species that find a home on Lehua. And Lehua is, um, if, you, if you look at it from a rodent eradication perspective, it, it, it has its own challenges from a technical perspective. You can see there are pretty steep cliff, cliffs and, and cliff faces and, and whatnot. So making sure that the rodent bait, this was a rat eradication, I should mention. Um, and, you know, the rats were, um, uh, in fact, have extirpated some of the, um, some of the seabird species from breeding on the island, uh, new shearwater and uh, Borlos petrels and, and whatnot. And to remove all of the rats from Lihua, again, we needed to follow all of those principles, one of which is making sure that every rat had access to the bait and making bait ac accessible in all of those um, uh, 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 cliffs and 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 uh, and whatnot is not something that is easy to do. So the only way we could do it was with aerial broadcast of the rodenticide. So what you see here on the picture is a helicopter that carries a big bucket on the bottom, and the pilot controls um, the the bait output um, going in and out of that bucket, and it distributes the the bait um, um, in kind of predefined lines on the island. So you know where bait is going, you know it's going everywhere. Um, so it's a technical uh, project, it's a complex technical project, but more importantly, it's a complex social and political endeavor. And so what you see here on the right is the representation of all of the partners that were involved with, um, or some of the partners anyways, that were involved with the, the eradication. So. It was led by the state of Hawaii, um, their Department of Land and Natural Resources. Um, it had uh, support from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. It is technically federal land. Um, it's owned by the Coast Guard. So the Coast Guard was also involved. We had um, 
some of the local um, uh, organizations, the National Tropical Botanical Gardens um, from in Hawaii, um, obviously had a vested interest in the plant restoration process that would follow and ourselves um, as well. So here is kind of the, the, the example of a partnership, right? So in, in the importance of partnerships cannot be overstated um, um, with eradication projects. And I would, I would um, extrapolate that to any conservation effort. Um, and in this case, the way we um, kind of centered this, this uh, large partnership was around a multi-stakeholder steering committee that had both public and private um, uh, members. So around this table, you have um, federal agencies. So you have USDA, you have the, so the US Department of Agriculture, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, you have the state uh, represented there with uh, the leading agency. Um, we have ourselves, we have um, some local representation uh, from communities. Um, and, and so the partnership allows you to, um, first of all, have a representative shared vision of the project, right? So um, we have a vision for Lehua, but the local community has a different vision for Lehua. The US, um, the federal agencies have a different vision. And by creating a multi-stakeholder steering committee, we create the opportunity to have a shared vision, one, one that everybody can, um, can uh, stand behind and that, can, that everybody wants to contribute to. So that shared vision is really what, what um, pushes the, the project forward and everybody in their own way and for different outcomes wants a free, uh, a rent free lehua um, in this case. It's a space where you can negotiate different aspects of the project. Um, one that I'll cite as an example here is that um, there's two rodenticides you could use uh, for eradication of, project, uh, of rats. Um, one is a more acute um, uh, rodenticide, one is a less toxic one uh, for non-target species, um, but it also means that rats have to eat more of it to um, receive a lethal dose. So deciding on which one to use whether to go more acute, have a higher chance uh, or a likelihood of success in eradicating the rats, but a higher non-target risk, or incurring the risk and, and, and um, sharing the risk of a, a, a less um, chance or a, a, a lower chance of success, but a lower um, non-target risk as well. And what this group decided was to go with, with with that lower um, toxicity uh, compound, difacinum, understanding all the risks that it imposed um, in the efficacy side of things. So what we did is with that in mind, we architected, we designed the strategy to um, uh, minimize some of those, um, uh, some of those uh, uh, challenges that that compound imposed from a technical perspective. So negotiating all of those aspects of the project, sharing the risks, but also owning the results is, is important. And through this multi-stakeholder multi steering committee, we were able to do that. And I should mention that we did actually, um, after the, the operation, have the unexpected outcome of rats on the island, um, which is possible was due to the use of, of the last toxic bait. And what that meant is that, you know, a big challenge is thrown into this partnership. And I can say that it stayed strong and it stayed together and stand, it stood by its choice, uh, collective choice, and, and it understood the risks going into it. So um, it stood together, it mounted a response, and we are actually today announcing a successful eradication on Lehua after two and a half years of monitoring without um, rat signs on, on the island. So the importance of this um, space um, and this shared vision is, is very important. And, and, and we can't overstate you know, how, how that plays a role into successful eradications. Um, the other thing is that these projects are highly regulated um, here in the US, but also elsewhere. Um, so um, rodenticide use at this scale is highly regulated. You have a, a different processes to go through and that takes years um, um, in many instances. In most cases, it takes years to go through all of that compliance. But then again, um, the risk of not following every 
every single requirement, legal requirement is jeopardizing the tool for future projects. So in a way, the regulatory process is there for good reason. It safeguards you know, trust resources um, from, from the use of our specific strategies. And also it allows us to uh, protect the integrity of the tool uh, for, for other projects um, into the future. So we're not jeopardizing our ability to continue to use this, this tool because we overlooked uh, compliance needs um, as well. And of course, community engagement is vital um, to these projects. And I will uh, say that these are typically controversial projects um, and the controversy can come from, um, in the case of rodenticides, from the anti-pesticide um, movement, but it can also come from um, animal rights uh, groups um, that are advocating for the animals and, you know, it not being their fault that they're there and why should they um, have to pay the price and whatnot. So they are generally very controversial uh, projects. And so uh, community engagement and um, adequate leadership for, for once, but also support and at least tolerance uh, from the community is very important. So uh, transparency is at the core of that communications um, strategy and for Lehua, we've used many different media um, to reach different audiences. Um, you know, we had uh, public meetings that were mandated by our compliance processes that happened um, on, on Hawaii, um, the closest big island um, to Lehua. Um, but more importantly, I think, is we created a, a monitoring um, that that would test the, the, the assumptions and the hypotheses that we made during the risk assessment processes. So we said, for instance, that we didn't expect any um, long lasting effects on fisheries or you know, the, the, the near shore fish uh, uh, communities and making sure that you go ahead and you test that and you provide the public with that information transparently of what you found in terms of residues of the written site you use and whatnot, this creates that process of trust. And again, it allows us to uh, protect the integrity of the tool so that we can continue to use it into the future. And so we have been uh, monitoring Lehua. Um, we, we monitored before, during, and after um, the, the rodenticide use and, and showed um, the, um, how, how, how the, the rodenticide moved into the food web, but also how quickly it disappeared from that food web and, and whatnot. So that, that level of transparency is at the core of um, a good com communication strategy and community engagement strategy uh, for us. And I think here's just some examples of materials that we've used um, to communicate why this is important, why we have to use the methods we use um, to, to remove invasive species. And this is a video of a very heated uh, public meeting that we had uh, for the Lihua project. And you're welcome to to find it online. And, and you can see that there are a lot of loud um, voices um, in the room that are questioning uh, the methods that are being proposed for use on Lehua. So making sure that you, you know, kind of take that into account when you're proposing in, 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 in the case of Lehua, one of the compromises was, okay, we'll use the less toxic rodenticide, you know, to um, uh, make sure that you incorporate those, um, uh, concerns from the, the community into the project um, is very important. Um, so this is just kind of an example of how much attention, local attention Lehua got. So we were on the news a lot and uh, most of the time not in a good light, um, I would say. So there were things um, from, you know, the, the, the Lehua rat poison um, caused the death of whales and, you know, the, the the poison drop schedule for Lehua is, you know, happening and, and all of that. And, but some also um, balanced by some um, support and um, from the community and whatnot. And, and, and it's important to mention that we worked closely with um, the native Hawaiian community uh, that would be most affected or that has the most cultural link to Lehua Island. Um, and they were part of that steering committee that we mentioned before. So uh, making sure that you kind of just balance all of those uh, inputs um, is, is challenging and, and important. 
So just to, to wrap us up then, what does it really take to eradicate invasive species? And it goes without saying that the eradication of invasive species should, should be our last resort. Um, when it comes to invasive species, it's always a best bet to invest on prevention. You know, announce that old saying of an ounce of prevention um, is worth a pound of, of cure. Um, and eradications is that pound of cure. Um, once you know the uh, your biosecurity um, and, and and other uh, mechanisms have failed and invasive species are established, you have to go ahead and, and eradicate them from the island. Um, so what what does it take to do that? I think to me um, the most important thing is that common vision, that shared representative vision for a project. I think it it it. It almost certainly would fail if somebody just came in and thought this was a good idea and imposed that idea. Yeah, into uh, community, local partners, and not so just and followed closely by the the strength of the partnership. So making sure that there is trust among partners and that there is um, um, representation and, and but also just skill sets represented that can move the project forward um, in the best way possible. Um, from a technical perspective, of course, following all of the principles of eradication that we've learned um, through the many projects that have been successful in the past and making sure that we don't overlook the technical component. Um, I think the worst case scenario for an eradication project is one in that you, you incur the risks by starting um, an eradication operation, but you don't um, rip the rewards, right? So you, you fail to eradicate that invasive species. So that's the worst possible scenario for all involved um, because we know we have inherent risks when we propose an eradication strategy that we only are willing to accept if there's long-term benefits. Um, so making sure that that technical component is not what prevents you from succeeding. And acknowledging that any ecological system has complexities beyond that that we can map um, and understand. So there's always that small uh, probability that you could fail because of something that you, know, you didn't uncover um, during your planning process. But should it not be the, that you fail to um, create a robust strategy and a technical approach that really answers um, the, the needs of that island. Um, legal compliance and following every single compliance requirement is also very important. Um, again, these processes are in place for good reason and they help us protect the tool into the future. And adaptive management, um, things happen um, and they, hardly ever go according to plan. Um, so making sure that you have robust project management skills in that core group um, that can um, be adaptive to the challenges that are thrown your way. Um, and these projects last a long time to, to come to fruition. Um, the Lihu example, it all started back in um, 2009 uh, when they did one first attempt um, and failed to eradicate the rats. And before that, you know, even uh, planning and, and whatnot had, had gone on for a long time. So these projects take a long time and a lot of resources. Um, so um, making sure that throughout that time, you're able to adaptively manage um, what's thrown at you is very important. So with that, uh, mahalo nui is um, thank you very much in the Hawaiian language. And I'm happy to take any questions, Carolyn, that um, folks have shared with us. Great, thank you so much, Patty, that was great. Um, we just had a recent success story with an eradication, so this was all very near and dear to my heart. Um, I have a couple of questions, hopefully you have time. One is, um, what is the approach to eradicate an invader that is in competition with an endemic or native species through shared prayer habitat? And I know um, what we've done on Anacapa, but I'm just curious if you have some general thoughts on how to avoid eradicating the wrong species. Yeah, and I think that's kind of where that um, that principle goes to, right? Is the non-target risks and minimizing, avoiding, minimizing, mitigating those risks. And and there are things that have been done in the past. Some of them are pretty extreme. In that sometimes you just have to uh, 
remove, uh, temporarily remove those species from the island, keep them in captivity until the risk is passed, and then reintroduce them to the islands. That was done, for instance, on Anacapa Island in California, where there is a native rodent um, to the island um, that was at risk uh, from, from a rodent eradication. And they were kept in captivity until the, the risk from the rodent site was gone and then brought back. That um, is, you know, has been used um, in the past for, for different species um, as well. The Galapagos hawk um, is another example um, in the Galapagos Islands. So, so there are some pretty extreme cases where mitigation takes a lot of resources and a lot of planning um, as well. Um, and in other instances, it's, it's really just sometimes avoiding uh, uh, or timing your eradication to avoid certain species. Um, that is often the case with shorebirds, migratory birds that are only on the island for a certain amount of time. So just avoiding their timing altogether is an effective way to minimize risks to those species. So it really depends on what you're, what you're looking at and, and why these projects are so tailored and take so long to plan. Yes. Um, another question that was good. So if you suspect your um, rats have learned to avoid your bait, then how long do you have to wait to try again? And then do rats forget or do you have to wait until the next generation of rats is, is up there? Do you know? Yeah, so, yeah, so we haven't been using, for a long time, eradications have stepped away from using baits that have that more immediate effect. So so we haven't been seeing that a whole lot, but I, my guess is that um, they would probably not forget um, and you would likely have to wait until the, the next generation um, is, is around. That, luckily though, with rats, that would be not so, uh, not so far, yeah. If anyone's tried to trap a rat in their attic, you know, if they learn about the method, then you're, they, you're uh, they, will, they will not come back, yeah. yes. Um, another question I thought was good. So we, you spoke today mostly of um, removing, removing invasive animals, and we had a couple questions about invasive plant removal. And um, for me, this is always very difficult, and people were wondering if there's any specifics or if, if island conservation works with plant removal. Um, mm -hmm. Or is it just too hard? And they, someone else was curious about if island conservation uses biological control agents against invasive plant species on islands. So a lot of interest in plant removal. Plants, yeah. Um, we island conservation focus on vertebrate um, invasive species on islands. So we don't, we haven't worked directly um, with plant species, with one exception. So currently, we are working on following on that Palmyra project where we removed rats from the atoll. We're now removing coconut, um, invasive coconut species or plants, palms uh, from the island. Um, so this is kind of our first um, uh, try on um, working with uh, plants. But that being said, coconuts are very different from a lot of the weeds that people probably have in mind in asking this question. And um, we, we haven't uh, worked with plants um, in the past. Um, there are um, generally plants are management of invasive plants are more geared towards control, effective control. Um, there are some examples from Midway Atoll, for instance, where they are nearly done with eradicating verbicina um, plants from the island. So there are some success stories on islands. Um, they haven't been led by us, but, but by partners um, in the US and outside. I mean, one last question that we just don't have very much time, but I, I think it's an important one. You talked about how you have to study how the poison can be mitigated so secondary poisonings don't occur that for non-target species. But do you also consider the moral implications, someone was curious about the moral implications of eradicating invasive species, um, any way to mitigate the suffering of the animals? And I know this comes up all the time in our work as it well. Does. And yeah, I think that's a very important one. And, and it, 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 I should have mentioned that, you know, all the methods that we use are, um, are the most humane or, or at least are humane methods um, that are, you know, uh, we, we don't impose any suffer, un undue suffering um, uh, with the methods that we choose. So again, that goes with the, the principles of eradication of not just educating your, your species, but also not causing undue um, suffering. You know, you don't want to miss a shot and injure an animal, for instance, and things like that. So, but it is a hard, a hard topic and why we get so much attention and, 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 and rightfully so from um, animal rights groups, you know, and, and 
um, we have been trying to work with them um, in making sure that we follow every single protocol for humane um, uh, uh, lethal um, methods um, in the field. Um, but it is, it is a contentious issue for sure. For sure. And then one quick last question. What's next for Hawaii and invasives um, with island conservation? Anything coming up? Yeah, so um, on the broader Hawaiian Islands, in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, um, just north of us here, the main Hawaiian Islands, we have a mouse eradication planned for next year. Um, so the mouse on Midway, I don't know if you've seen all on the news, but the mouse have turned into eating um, or predating on adult albatross and causing injury to adult um, individuals as well as, as chicks and, and, and eggs and whatnot. So we have been planning an eradication of mice on, on Midway for several years now, and it's now it's got, del got delayed by COVID and it's now planned uh, for next year. And then here on the main Hawaiian islands, um, our crown project, so to speak, uh, would be the island of Kaho'olawe, um, just off of Maui. And uh, Kaho'olawe is a very important cultural uh, practice island, uh, but also has had uh, military bombing and, and whatnot um, on the island. So it's a lot of the seabirds have been extirpated and it currently has cats and rats that prevent the, the restoration of the island. Um, so we're hoping that in the near future, we can um, eradicate rats and cats from Kaho'olawe as well. Great. Okay, one more um, comment before I let you all go. The um, South African Department of Forestry, we had a post from someone who works for the South African Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment and BirdLife South Africa. They've um, started a project to eradicate house mice from Marion Island, which is a yeah. South African territory. And they're currently advertising certain positions for this project. And then, so if you're interested in those, please do check the chat and um, you can see um, uh, where you could apply for those positions. Okay, yeah, that's, that's an amazing project and I'm, I'm really cool. cheering, cheering you guys on. So next month you can join us for um, one last workshop before we take a short break over the summer holidays. And we're delighted that Dr. Tetsuya Amano will lead our final workshop of the spring on the importance of addressing language barriers in conservation and how we can start tackling this issue. So you can register now and you can find out more about this workshop on the AER website. So as mentioned before the start of today's workshop, the AER search platform is now live. So you can use your own search terms and the filters to find that are available to find the content in your topics of interest across multiple document types. AER and our content will continue to grow and develop. So register on AER now and sign up for alerts on your topics of interest and um, other AER developments. Again, I'm just gonna leave you with details of today's AER Live sponsor, Wildlife Acoustics. So as well as creating cutting edge recorders and software for monitoring and analyzing environmental sounds, Wildlife Acoustics offers a wide range of free online training courses, video tutorials, and much more. So visit wildlifeacoustics.com forward slash resources for more information. So thanks again to everyone for joining us today. And I hope to see you all next month at the next ADR Live. Have a wonderful day.